cool. I'm Tony Lee Thomas. Um, this band is called Sonic Malfunction, which we spell with a K so that it says funk in the middle. You mind trying like a dirty Wurlitzer sound, JD? Because that synth is just not, it's not quite, quite cutting through in the mix. Um, and Christian, for the, for the guitar, I mean, because there's the organ and the other two guitars, when you're playing down low, it's getting sort of a little lost in there. Um, so if you're high and you're floating sort of above that register where everybody else is sitting, it's going to come through a little clear. Any dirt you can throw on the keyboard? Oh yeah. Cool. All right, here we go. I'll, I'll do that after the fact. Right. What if you tried bringing the organ out during the those so, so, solos back and forth? Bring it out, meaning lose it? Or just yeah, and just have it be them soloing. That's the, a great idea. Let's, try, let's see if there's a good way to get it out of there. One second. Sort of colliding with what JD's doing on that. Yeah, there's a lot of notes being played there. <laughs> yeah. Between those two keyboards. Yeah. I mean, everybody has a different experience. My my path has been a little, a little longer. I'm 38 now. This is my ninth or tenth recording project. Um, my first project was with a band I started fresh out of the army in 2002 with my little sister. And we didn't have a lot of money. We got our band together from a couple of guys we met in an open mic. And, you know, we were like scraping, you know, early 20s, just mm -hmm. spending our money on cheap 40s, you know. But we had a couple of songs and we also were really green and really naive and, you know, a lot of musicians come out with what I think is a very common sort of misconception about the music industry that, you know, you get discovered and then you get famous. And nowadays it's like, you know, I can't tell you how many people come up to me and say, uh, oh, you should go on American Idol. Mm -hmm. Like that's how you become famous. If becoming famous is even your goal. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of working musicians out there that just want to have work in music, mm -hmm. not necessarily in performance. But that was our that was our our uh, naivety was that we thought after we had written a handful of songs that you know if the right person heard them you know we'd get a record contract and be rich and famous and hopefully save the world with our message of love you know so we start pop we know we poked around and the first studio that we went to look at was um, man I don't know if I can remember the name of it anyway we walk in it was like I'm from Berkshire County so we were looking around the Berkshires. And uh, Derek Studios, that was like the most reputable studio in the area at the time. So we went in there, met, they gave us this tour, you know, we're walking around. And then, of course, at the end of the tour comes, well, what does it cost? And it was something like, you know, $100 an hour for this guy, $120 an hour for that guy. But if you're looking for a deal, you can get this guy for $80 an hour. And we're like great we'll be in touch you know what i mean like we had maybe a hundred bucks or 200 bucks so it was like forget it and then you know through a friend of a friend we ended up meeting this guy todd mack who had just opened off the beat and track studios in southfield at the time or something and because they had just opened and they were brand new to recording as well he was a musician who had been a performer for years and he wanted to open a recording studio he was willing to give us a deal because studio time is so expensive that they didn't feel justified charging people a common rate because they're spending time figuring stuff out. Mm -hmm. So rather than giving us some astronomical hourly rate because they were just getting started, they said, you know, come on down, we'll give you, you know, your first album for like 500 bucks. You just have to be prepared for the fact that we're going to be figuring stuff out as we go along too. Mm -hmm. And it worked out great. But that was the first recording project. And then since then, every project and I realized that there was so much that I didn't know about the recording process not even as an engineer that I wanted to record with a different facility a different producer and a different engineer every time I went in the studio because everybody has different skill sets people are using different software people have different equipment so how do I learn as much as I can about the recording process over time mm -hmm. by working with all kinds of different people so from there, we ended up going and trying to mix and master a live recording from Club Helsinki the following year. And uh, 
course that band broke up and then I started my own solo project and my first solo record we recorded in a basement on somebody's ADAT machine. And then the, next, the album after that I went down to Substation Studios and Who's a Tonic Mass. Big step up from the basement, you know. And, uh, and then I felt like I wanted to try to do a release on my own so um, I hired an engineer, Scott Guberman, to come to the house with his equipment to tech so that you know, I could play all the instruments and mm -hmm. do all that stuff and then, you know, so like different different projects over the years and then eventually, it was a few years ago, uh, a good friend of mine, Shannon Plaquet, who owns Wicked Cool Productions out of Springfield, called me up and said, hey man, you know, I've had a good year, like, what if I backed you for a record in a really nice facility? So he says, North Fire, and I didn't, I'd never heard of it. But I did know the Alchemistics. I had been a fan of theirs for a long time. Mm -hmm. So he says, yeah, no, the Alchemistics, like they started this studio. So I'm envisioning like, I've seen them play, but I don't really know them very well. So I'm just envisioning like a band with recording gear in their basement or something. And I come here and it's this. Mm -hmm. And then come to find out Garrett is so well studied. He's got amazing skills. He has a really sensitive ear. So he's hearing stuff that people with skills might not necessarily hear but he also has a really broad taste in music, mm. which means he has the capability to capture and mix and render music in a lot of different genres, which is the most rare thing about Garrett because most engineers or producers that you work with have a specific skill set, you know? They're really good at dialing in that 80s hair band or they really have a great niche for hip hop, you know? But if you don't choose your producer or your engineer, who has a skill set relative to your genre, then what they capture ends up being different than what your vision is. And then you end up having to ask them for something that's not sky of their skill set. And anytime you do that, it just leads to frustration. So it's amazing that Garrett has the flexibility he does. Um, actually, before we do this one, do you guys want to come in and check your tones, make sure you're happy with how you guys are sounding through the mics? Or you could just tell me what to change. I think, Tony, I think you're sounding fine, Jeff. I feel like it's a little bit dark. Yeah. Or like a little bit heavy in the low end. Okay, that might, fix, that might open it up. Alright, cool. Let's, let's give us another go then. I would definitely say that it can be worth it, but the advice that I would give, I mean, first and foremost, have a plan. You have to have a plan. And that means having your music prepared and well manicured, because if you walk into the studio with an idea, it's going to take you way more time to realize that idea than if you come in rehearsed. So that means you're going to spend a lot more money, and then there goes the value of your time and your, and your effort. But also, it's not just about capturing that music. You have to have a plan. Where, what are you trying to do with it? Yeah. Are you trying to book shows with it? That may affect the nature of the material that you mm -hmm. record. Are you trying to get radio play? Are you trying to... Um, sell albums. Yeah, are you trying to get attention from a label? Are you just trying to sell albums? Are you trying to sell digitally? Or are you planning on manufacturing hard copy? Mm -hmm. And you gotta think about all this stuff because you walk into a studio and whatever you're paying, you know, people want to get the most for what they have, but if you spend your budget on recording and you don't realize that you still have to mix those recordings, you have to master those recordings. After the mastery is done, you have to get your manufacturing done or your distribution done. Mm -hmm. You know, these are all calculated expenses that if you have a plan from start to finish how you're going to realize what your goals are, then you will get the value out of the money and the time and the energy that you spend doing it. But if you go into it without a plan, 90% of businesses fail for one reason. They didn't have a plan. Mm -hmm. you know? And unfortunately, that's the nature of the industry, which is that as artists, we have a passion for what we do. But not everybody related to you in the industry is passionate about your craft. Mm -hmm. They're passionate about making money. So when you're play whether you're playing at a venue or you're working with a booking agent or a manager, these are people who got into this business. They might be fans, but they have bills to pay too. And even though your music might be great, the question is, how many tickets are you going to sell? Or, you know, how well is this music going to be received in the environment in which you choose to place it? That could be soundtracking, it could be, 
you know, any number of different possibilities. So identify your goals, make a plan, then approach your studio. You know, absolutely. If everybody involved has a vocabulary for the equipment and the technique, um, then that's just the language that you can use to really subtly, you know, nuance in a nuanced way mm -hmm. to communicate what it is you're looking for. But on the flip side of that, even facilities like this end up getting paid to record new artists that don't have that vocabulary. Yeah. So sometimes it's more challenging for an engineer like Aaron. I'm just guessing here, but you know, I've seen him work with them really well and it, you know, he'll listen and go, I, I think I know what you mean, you know? So the translation of what they're asking for when they're saying, you know, I want it to sound more like this, bump, 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 versus bam, 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 bam. It's like, well, are you talking about frequency? Are you talking about gain, you know? So if they don't have that vocabulary, can you identify what it is they're asking for? And he's really good at that too. What somebody said to me early on, and it's really important to treat everyone with respect because you see the same people on the way up that you see on the way back down. Ooh, I like that. So for example, everyone that I met in here, cause you know, they have interns coming and going and the interns that are here now are obviously not the same as the dudes that were here uh, three years ago when I recorded here. But I'm still in touch with and friends with all of the interns that worked here three years ago. Because they were, right off the bat, people are respond to friendliness way more than they do to attitude. So this kid comes in and asks me if I want a cup of coffee. I'm like, I make my own coffee. And uh, I'm not used to being served a cup of coffee. And I'm, I, I came here to work. I'm not in a restaurant, you know what I mean? But I'm like blown away by that. So I'm like... Dude, that's really nice of you. What's your name? So we end up shooting the shit. Turns out he's in a band. Next thing you know, we split a couple of shows together at Bishop's. They rocked it. And come to find out, you know, now he's like down in Tennessee. These guys are doing great. But so, so what does that mean? Now from just meeting an intern and being friendly enough with that kid who I didn't have to be. Mm -hmm. Now I got a buddy down in Tennessee who's cow shine crash on if I'm in the neighborhood. You know what I mean? And vice versa. He comes back up here. It's like, bro, great to see you. When are we jamming? You know? So, uh, you know, reaching out to everybody and finding out a little bit about who they are, especially when you don't necessarily have to. I mean, you come and work here. You know, you're going to work with Gary. You're going to meet Jay. And the interns generally won't engage you unless you engage them. But engage them, yeah. you know?